Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for this installment of the PENC webinar series. My name is Katie Cox and I am the PENC Membership Director. I will be serving as moderator for today's presentation. If you have any technical difficulties, please use the chat box and I will try to assist you. We will be taking questions at the end of the presentation today. However, if you do have uh, an urgent question that you'd like to have addressed, you can go ahead and type that question in. Today's presenter is Brian Ceccarelli. Brian is a licensed professional engineer in the state of North Carolina. Mr. Ceccarelli has a degree in physics from the University of Arizona. As principal software engineer for Talus Software PLLC, Mr. Ceccarelli has developed computer-aided mining applications, CAD CAM applications, biomedical applications, and space exploration applications for Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Chuck Riley became interested in traffic engineering when the town of Cary, North Carolina bestowed upon him a red light camera ticket. Since then, Mr. Chuck Riley has been published in Traffic Technology International and has been an expert panelist in traffic signal timing for the Institute of Transportation Engineers. He has presented for the North Carolina Society of Engineers, the American Society of Civil Engineers, the National Society of Professional Engineers, and for the United Kingdom International Press's Autonomous Vehicle Symposiums in Europe and America. Chuck Riley is an expert witness in traffic signal timing and red light cameras in several states. Thank you for being here. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian, and uh, uh, my presentation today is about physics, engineering practice, and jurisprudence. And I, I aim to tell you how these, these three things tie together. A uh, little backstory. Uh, 10 years ago, it all started for me uh, when I got uh, that red light camera ticket in the town of Cary. And when that uh, camera flashed behind my head, the first thing that went through my head was, man, this yellow light does not conform to Newton's second law of motion. And I knew that there was a physics problem right off the bat. And, and what I, as a citizen, a naive citizen, when I approached the DOT in the town of Cary about this physics problem, this, in the formula that the DOT uses to say yellow lights, and they just kind of thought it was a wacko. And uh, but no, just to let you know, nobody has ever criticized the math and physics that I have presented in the last two webinars. Uh, they just uh, blow it off. But so I have, I have sought uh, an engineering remedy for 10 years now, even on the bequest of the North Carolina board to get down to the bottom of all this and to see what's going on. Uh, the board of engineers gave me a, a, an informal quest in about 2015 that said, Brian, go change the federal guidelines. And so I've been trying to do that. And uh, now this is 2019 and I finally, over the last few months, with the help of several lawyers and other engineers and physicists, finally came to the conclusion that, you, that you're going to see in this webinar. If I were you, uh, I would um, do a screenshot of this, uh, this title page while you can, because you probably want to refer back to it. Um, you'll, I post this uh, PowerPoint on my own website here. There's the, there's the address of it. And uh, and away we go. So in this webinar, I plan on covering the topic of jurisprudence, which is the principles of law, the historical ones, and how the red light cameras and yellow light durations uh, fit into the history and the principles of law. And then I'll talk to you a little bit about modern manifestations of these principles of law and how they make it into our state statutes. We'll move on, which is a great transition to engineering practice. Uh, every state has a set of statutes called their own Engineering Practice Act, which requires um, engineers to license, to have a license and to certify their engineering works. Uh, mandates engineers to only practice within their area of competence. And then I'll, because I know that there's some attorneys listening in on all this, uh, I'm going to uh, list a few common mistakes made by legislators, judges, and attorneys, which are unfamiliar with engineering practice law. Um, I've been in several court uh, litigation 
cases regarding a lot of these things. And the same mistakes are, that attorneys make, they make case after case, they play like a broken record. And so then, then I'm going to tie engineering practice law into physics. And I'm going to state that the ITE yellow change and all red clearance intervals practice is not an engineering practice. By the time we get to this point, you're going to see exactly why. We'll move on to is physics binding in court? Funny question. One would think it would be, but it's not entirely obvious, especially some of the things I've been through, which I will tell you about very amusing stories. And then we'll have a review of the misapplications of the physics and math by ITE, stuff that I covered in the first two webinars. And then I'll mention something about the guilty. Who's guilty in all this? Um, and we'll, we'll close right there. So it all starts with a concept in jurisprudence a thousand years ago. So this story is so applicable to red light cameras and yellow light durations, it's scary. So a thousand years ago, exactly almost to the day, uh, King Canute was a famous Viking king. He's a king of England for several years. He's a very powerful one. And uh, I'll just tell you the story. Um, um, as recorded by Henry of Huntington in the 12th century. Uh, many of you know, may remember your history lesson that King Canute was the guy who issued a decree to halt the tides. And there's a little backstory to him trying to do this. And there's a lot of, every day in, uh, in, uh, in his court, the land barons would come in and different people would come into his court and ask King Canute to grant them favors. I want this, give me that, you should do this, King Canute, for me. Well, he got so fed up with all this, a steady procession of people asking him for favors and, and praising him because he's king and that the king can do anything, that one day he took his throne. And uh, can, I'll just read it. Uh, Canute, Canute set his throne by the seashore and commanded the incoming tide to halt and not wet his feet in robes. Yet continuing to rise as usual, the tide dashed over his uh, feet and legs without respect to his royal person. Then the king leapt backwards saying, let all men know how empty and worthless is the power of kings, for there is none worthy of the name, but he whom heaven, earth, and sea obey by eternal laws. He then hung his gold crown on a crucifix and never wore it again to, honor, to the honor of God, the almighty king. The point being is that though he's king, the, the supreme legislator of the land, he can't enforce a law which conflicts with the laws of nature. He can't raise his hands like you see him doing there and command the tides to halt. The moon's gravity is going to bring those tides in no matter what. There's nothing he can do about it. And so he, he knows that his decree is futile and, and stupid, but he did it to prove a point that no legislator can pass a law that conflicts with the laws of nature. This ties into the, the red light, uh, this ties into the yellow light duration problem very well because um, the practice of setting yellow light durations conflicts with the laws of nature and government, those laws of nature as being the laws of physics, the same, actually the same law that the yellow light durations disobey is the same, is the same sort of thing that King Canute's doing here. They're both trying to buck Newton's second law of motion, F equals MA. Now, the person who introduced me to King Canute was uh, Paul Stamm. He's an attorney here in North Carolina who, uh, who I went to once I discovered this physics problem with the, and a problem with the North Carolina DOT's uh, standard. And if you have a problem with the law you and nobody's listening, the engineers don't want to do anything about it, you go to your state representative. So I went to him, he was my state representative. His father is a chemist, so he had a, a, a good deal of respect for science. And he has a wonderful understanding of uh, the history of law and the concepts. Um, he was also, Paul Stam was also the General Assembly Speaker pro tem for, for several years. 
Uh, Paul Stamm is also handling uh, the current litigation against the city of Greenville for all the things you're about to hear. Another big man in, in the name of jurisprudence is a guy named Marcus Cicero. Uh, he was a thousand years before King Canute. And uh, he is one of the fathers of Western law. And one of his most famous philosophies of law is right reason. I learned right reason back in high school days. And uh, if there's laws just don't come out of nowhere, his idea was that laws only come from reason. If there's a reason for something to have a law, then you make the law. The laws come from right reason. And right reason has to be in agreement with nature. Um, you, can't, uh, um, you can't pass a law, you can't have any law that disagrees with nature. So, and these sort of, uh, these sort of laws of nature and the next a yellow um, highlight here is that we cannot be freed from its obligations by Senate or people, and we need not look outside ourselves for an expounder or interpreter of it. There will not be different laws in Roman and Athens. These laws of nature apply everywhere, no matter where you are. You don't need an expounder or interpreter of it. Nobody needs to hire a physicist to, to expound on physics because it's a natural law of nature. Anybody can learn physics. It's, it's there for anybody to see. You don't have to be a licensed professional engineer to expound on physics. Anybody can because it's out there. It's free. It's a law of nature. The engineers don't hold the keys of the kingdom to the laws of physics. You'd be surprised how many times that particular topic came up in depositions uh, for my expert witnesses, the, 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 the town of Cary's lawyer kept on asking my, my physicist friends, are you a licensed professional engineer? As if that makes a difference whether you know the laws of physics or not. So Cicero, uh, but, but by the way, you know, uh, Paul Stamm brought up both Cicero and King Canute in hearings. And they speak volumes. If you know Cicero and you, and you know the tale of King Canute, they speak volumes, but most of the time these uh, stories uh, um, fall on deaf ears. The judge doesn't know Canute or doesn't know Cicero, but it is interesting. So engineering malpractice looks like this. This I, The red light camera industry looks like this. Uh, if an iceberg of malfeasance out there, a common citizen comes into this problem, he gets a red light camera ticket, photo enforcement, and the first thing he usually comes across is this bribery thing, like there's red light cameras, companies are being bribed like red flex, for bribing people to keep their cameras, and this happens a lot. There's other laws being made corrupt, like uh, in the photo enforcement industry, um, uh, it turns the concept of you're innocent until proven guilty into you're innocent only if you blame somebody else. There's this corruption of man-made laws going on there. Uh, process laws, it's constitutional, it's not constitutional, it's due process, correct, not correct, it's this criminal or, or a civil case. And the, the laws that the red light camera companies actually package and introduce to state legislatures corrupt these existing laws subtly but effectively. What the common citizen doesn't see is this, this big iceberg down here underneath the waters, the engineering malpractice, which feeds everything above. If it wasn't for this down here, there wouldn't be a red light camera industry. And I'm gonna tie all this stuff together with a bow in this webinar. Now, if you're interested in uh, the problems with the photo enforcement industry with regards to the United States Constitution, Professor uh, Adam McLeod of Falcon University has the definitive article on this one. It's a beautiful thing. Um, and uh, you'll find it in uh, uh, the public discourse. It's an online magazine. 
I can't, I can't exactly remember who publishes it, but it's a beautiful, uh, a beautiful treatise on the subject, uh, civil versus criminal law, and everything that is that's turned upside down in photo enforcement. This and the next one as Don Mankiewicz, he's a screenwriter and novelist who wrote uh, an episode of Star Trek, the original series called Court Martial, on February 2nd, 1967, which beautifully explains how the red light camera industry works. Uh, in that episode, uh, uh, Captain Kirk is, uh, uh, is accused of uh, killing a guy named Charles Finney. And, but Charles, it's the ship's logs, the cameras on the bridge are, are, are recording uh, Captain Kirk's doings and sayings. And, and, it can, and, it sh and it looks like Captain Kirk is guilty of killing Charles Finney. But really what has happened is that Charles Finney had reprogrammed the ship's computer to make it look like Captain Kirk is guilty. So behind the scenes, somebody is programming the computer, which is framing Captain Kirk. This is a, a, a beautiful representation of what, what the red light camera industry is about. The cameras are there, they're photographing drivers entering the intersection after the light turned red. But it's actually the traffic engineer misprogramming the traffic signal who is making the drivers run the red light. It looks like the drivers are guilty. That's what the cameras are for, to make the drivers look guilty. But really, underneath the covers, the traffic signal has been misprogrammed. Uh, the computers, uh, one of the points the episode makes is that the computer is seemingly infallible. It's an infallible piece of machinery. It's just been programmed wrong. So there's kind of. Uh, two pieces to this. There's engineering practice, and there's and we'll touch we'll talk about the law about with regards to licensure and seals. Licensure, we get a license to indicate our competency. It doesn't guarantee our competency, but it just indicates we're we were competent at one time or we're competent, we're competent about some sort of uh what's ever on the test. And every time we do an engineering work, uh, we uh, professional engineers will put our seal on it and sign it and date it. And that is to guarantee accountability to the public. We're, we're, uh, we are, um, this is our mandate in North Carolina laws in order to safeguard life, health and property and to promote the public welfare. The practice of engineering and the practice of land surveying in the state are hereby declared to be subject to regulation in the public interest. Okay, that's the purpose of engineering practice law. And there's provisions and which you need to be duly licensed. Okay. The right to engage in the practice of engineering or land survey is a personal right based on the qualifications of the person as evidenced by the person's certificate of licensure. And then any work we do to make sure that we're accountable to the public is that our final drawings and specification plans and reports when issued will be certified and stamped with a seal or facsimile of a seal, so forth and so on. This is so that um, if something happens wrong with the operation of our designs, the implementation of our designs, the public can hold us accountable. We're accountable to all these, our own work. Uh, we're answerable to the public. And so when we put our stamp of approval on an engineering work, we back it up with our, our license and our career saying that we guarantee it personally. Licensure is all about personal accountability. Now, the first thing I'm going to show you is that the red, there's two parts of the engineering of all this. Now you haven't seen what's coming up next. The, not only, you know, I've been talking about yellow light durations for the last two webinars, but there's also red light camera, speed camera installation plans that are also engineering works. And, uh, and you're gonna see something that's probably gonna surprise all of you. 
Here's one, a red light camera system for Miller Place in Suffolk County, New York. And if you see something wrong with this, I'll give you 10 seconds to look it over. What is wrong with this? Give it a good look. Okay, there is no seal, signature date of a licensed professional engineer on this. The question is, is this an engineering work or not? Red light camera installation plans look like there's about 10 pages. Usually the first page is a survey map of the intersection. It tells you where to put the cameras, the dimensions of where to put the cameras. This is supposed to be stamped by a licensed surveyor, but it's not. Same plan has some structures, some foundation structures. Here's the camera, here's the pole, the foundation. Okay, there's no, this is a structure, there's no stamp or certification of a licensed professional engineer on this either. Here's a third page. This is like three pages out of 10. Now those traffic engineers out there are gonna see that these are advanced warning signs and the MUTCD requires as a standard that advanced warning signs be placed as an engineering study, as a result of an engineering study. So formally in the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices, which is a, a federal document which states adopt as law, these signs can only be there by an engineering study, yet there's no engineer who sealed this plan. When confronted about this, the, uh, uh, the camera companies and the traffic engineers who direct their red light camera programs and the city council who defend their red light programs with these two statements. These statements play like a broken record. I mean, every city, Suffolk County, Wilmington, uh, North Carolina, uh, Fayetteville, Greenville, they all say the same. Oh, they're just cameras on a stick. And the operation of the camera is independent from its installation plans. And the camera, let's proceed. That was Xerox is a red light camera company. This is, um, American Traffic Solutions, now known as Vera Mobility. And you see a seal here, but you don't see a signature or a date. Okay. Nassau County's American Traffic Solutions, seal date. This seal, actually, let's see if I can blow it up there. You can't read it that well. It's, it's, uh, signed by a man, well, it's it's the seal of a man named Robert Zaytuni. Robert Zaytuni gets around the red light camera plans for ATS. He's licensed to practice engineering in four or five states. ATS simply uses his seal and copies it on these plans. Zaytuni had nothing to do with supervising the work done here. He wasn't in responsible charge, they just have this JPEG of the seal on file and smack it on these, and smack it on these plans. There's no signature, no date. Uh, same uh, plans up in Nassau County. Seal, no signature. City of New Orleans is also an American uh, traffic solutions. Uh, uh, client and the engineer record Zaytuni shows up again. Okay, here's a map where these things are going to be. Here's some more detail. No, no, no seal or anything here. Not even, let alone a signature and a and a. Um, this problem is this omission of a valid seal is not just limited to red light cameras, but also speed cameras. So the speed cameras have the same sort of plans. 
They're about 10 pages long. They same sort of intersection and street maps and surveys maps. None of them are certified by a licensed professional engineer. What we found in, in New Orleans is that when we asked New Orleans for their certified plans, it turns out that the city did not even possess them. They did not possess them. We, they did not possess their own photo enforcement engineering plans. They did not have it. Uh, American Traffic Solutions had them in Phoenix. They had a request ATS to send them these plans. ATS is the custodian of the plans. New Orleans doesn't even know what's going on. When I told the Board of Engineers in Louisiana about this, he, he the investigator was like angry. He was so mad because what has happened is that how can you construct engineering works? What company, what contractor is going to install this stuff if they're not signed and sealed by a licensed professional engineer? Well, ATS gets around that by uh, creating its own contracting company in Louisiana, and then it gives all the work to its own contracting company. And the words of the investigator in Louisiana was like, man, that company has a lot of chutzpah. That case is still going on in Louisiana. It's case 2019-1. Now, look at Zaytuni. We're going to move to Wilmington, North Carolina. You're going to get the impression that these uncertified plans is not the exception, it's the rule in this industry. Uh, here's Wilmington, North Carolina. Take a look at uh, the engineer of record, Zaytuni. Well, guess what? Zaytuni has never been licensed in the state of North Carolina, ever. Again, ATS simply has these templates they're using to create these plans and they forgot to erase Zaytuni's name from the title, from these from these sheets, from these drawings. But they remembered in this one to, re, to remove it. Um, by the way, this sign you'll see appearing in a lot of red light camera intersections, this sign violates the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices. It's not a legitimate regulation sign. Um, it's not, and in the North Carolina, the law says you must have advanced warning signs, which are usually diagonal signs painted red or yellow, not, not these regulatory signs. So every intersection in Wilmington was installed illegally uh, because it never got the advanced, the, the, even just the sign is, is wrong, not to mention the lack of engineering seal. And North Carolina also requires the company who is drawing up these plans be licensed in the state of North Carolina. ATS is not licensed here. Uh, here's here's a, a plan from a Wilming from a Greenville, North Carolina. There's a lawsuit going on in, against Greenville, North Carolina. Uh, when the litigate uh, the litigation began uh, before Greenville installed its first red light camera. And so we sued them before it began. And uh, so when we asked for the plans, the red light camera plans, even back then, we asked for the signed and sealed. Well, it turns out that ATS wouldn't give Greenville the signed and sealed plans. But six months later, we got these sort of plans with this sort of seal on it, which turns out to be illegitimate. Uh, one, you can't read the signature, but it also turns out that uh, that uh, that this guy, uh, the Board of Engineers did the research on this. this. The man who actually sealed this did not supervise any of this work. He got reprimanded, a uh, $5,000 fine, uh, a mandate to take a remedial professional ethics class. And if he doesn't pass it, he gets his license revoked. ATS is trying to find a way to legitimize its legitimate plans. You can't, an engineer cannot sign and seal a plan after the fact. You can't do that. Uh, here's a fun one. 
one year later after ATS is notified by the Board of Engineers is practicing without a license, putting invalid, invalid certifications, American Traffic Solutions does a plan for Salinas, California. Now, ATS is well aware that it needs to certify plans. So there's this certification mark. Nope, there's no date on this. And the seal has got the wrong number on it. This, this, this seal, by the way, is on, and the signature is on four pages of the Salinas red light camera plans, but it's an exact copy. Each page is an exact, each seal is an exact copy of the other. The signatures are identical, exact copies. Um, there's something fishy going on here, obviously, and the, book, the California Board of Engineers is now taking action on this. What you're seeing is deliberate acts of breaking engineering practice acts by the red light camera companies. Red Flex in Denver, Colorado is no different. Here's uncertified plans. Um, and in, in Denver by Red Flex is not licensed to practice engineering in Colorado. Now, when, when you ask some cities to hand over their, their red light camera installation plans, they simply say, no, we're not gonna give them to you. For instance, in Fayetteville, North Carolina, uh, Fayetteville responded to a the FOIL request and said, ATS said, no, there's this is proprietary information listed with regards to our setup. They're not gonna give public they're not gonna give their red light camera installation plans, even though they're owned by the public on the public right of way to the public. By the, this time, ATS is wising up. And so they're just putting a clamp down and giving its red light camera installation plans to anybody. Some even go further than that. Like uh, uh, a friend of mine asked for the, some red light camera and speed camera plans in New York City under this FOIL request. And they respond, this is the response, has closed your FOIL request, blah, blah, blah. Your request under the Freedom of Information Law is denied because the records you requested are exempt from disclosure under this section. Well, the law says, each section shall in accordance with its published rules, make available for public inspection and copying all records, except that such agency may deny access to records or portions thereof that are compiled for law enforcement purposes and which if disclosed would interfere with law enforcement investigations or judicial proceedings. Now, that means that the NYC DOT does not wanna hand over the plans because somehow this is going to interfere with their law enforcement. My guess is that there's not a single red light or speed light camera in New York City that's been operating legally ever. It's billions of dollars with a fraud, billions of engineering fraud there. They will not do it. This sort of attitude is common among uh, city councils who are trying to defend their photo enforcement program, getting all the money they can. They believe it's okay to break the law in order, in order to enforce the law. I'll say that again. This, this happened in the city of Raleigh years before this. Uh, it's okay not to tell our the people getting these tickets that all they have to do is sign an affidavit saying they were not driving at the time and location of the citation. If we actually tell them the law, they won't pay their tickets. They feel it's okay, justify to break the law in order to enforce the law. Now here's uh, just to make sure so that you know I'm not kidding about the Board of Engineers taking this seriously. Here's a judgment against American Traffic Solutions by the North Carolina Board of Engineers. Here's the judgment of the North Carolina Board of Engineers against the guy who illegally certified the Greenville plans, reprimand. I blacked out the name because I just, you guys don't need to know, but it is interesting. Uh, here's Red Flex in Colorado, a cease and desist against uh, Red Flex there. Now that's a lot to swallow. All this stuff seems to be the rule in the red light camera industry. All these plans are indeed engineering works 
or and surveying works, but none are certified by a licensed practice, licensed engineer. There are cases in some cities like Raleigh. They Raleigh uses Xerox, for instance, and there are uh, sealed uh, red light camera installation plans. But Raleigh redacts the seal so that the public can't read it, which is also illegal in North Carolina. All I know is that in the past, all these companies know that they must seal the plans because there are examples for all these companies of sealed plans at one point. They just stopped doing it like a decade ago. Now, let's get, we're gonna transition now to like a, a yellow lights. How's the yellow light stuff uh, work into all this? Um, this is a lawyer in, uh, in, uh, in New Suffolk County, New York. He and I work together on a lot of the issues of Suffolk County. Suffolk County is a plethora of engineering problems. Um, every time you turn around, there's some other problem. I showed you Xerox plans, for instance, that are not signed and sealed by a licensed professional engineer, but it doesn't stop there. The traffic signal plans are not signed by a licensed professional engineer either. And any of the traffic signal timing sheets are not either. There's nothing, the laws are not any different than in New York than in North Carolina or Colorado or California. It's all the same. And so um, there's some real crazy stuff going on in New York. Now, concerning the yellow lights, this statement here, it took literally David and I, several other lawyers, 10 years to boil it down. It all boils down to this. The standard of care that traffic engineers use to time the yellow light departs from the standard of care under engineering practice law. The standard of care is an ITE practice of setting the yellow light durations, but that does not meet the requirements of engineering practice law. It, it all has to do with how does physics, there's problems in the physics with the ITE practice, how does this connect to engineering practice law? Are the laws of physics binding in a court of law? Here's uh, Judge Ridgeway, and uh, uh, he's the one that judged the case, in my case, against the town of Cary. The answer is yes, through engineering practice law. So these cities have, uh, states have the definition of engineering practice, which is in this state, any service or creative work the adequate performance which requires the application of the special knowledge of the mathematical, physical, and engineering sciences. Physical sciences, one of them is physics. California, New York, Texas, Webster's Dictionary, every state has such a law or guideline that says this. So physics is binding through engineering practice law. Most states adopt the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices. Um, it's how you're, uh, uh, for, it's, to, uh, it's an engineering document that tells the standards and the guidelines for how you set your yellow lights among many things. And as a standard, which means all engineers must obey this one, the duration of the yellow change interval shall be determined using engineering practices. Defined by state law, application of physics. Not misapplications of physics, applications of physics. Same thing goes for all red clearance intervals. Now, there are uh, several, uh, in a court of law, many times the uh, defendants, the, the traffic engineers and the lawyers trying to defend their program will bring up things like, we're just using the ITE, yellow change interval formula, because the MUTCD says so. But in the MUTCD is a special document called the Systems Requirements Specification. Engineers know what these are. It has the vocabulary specific to engineers. The engineer is only required to implement standards. Any things like support and guidance statements, like this one here, that the yellow change interval should be a minimum of three and a maximum of six is guidance only. Any statements that are like that, engineers use at his own discretion. They're not required because they do not always apply. If they always apply, they would be standards. Now, even standards are written by fallible humans. So if you got a bad standard, it's the duty of the engineer to change it. To drill a point home, even case law says that you can use uh, 
basic physics calculations, the court is supposed to recognize basic physics, speed and distance calculations, scientific facts. It's not just engineering practice, the definition of that that kicks in, it's also case laws in North Carolina. So I'm gonna make this wild statement, which is going to make mad every traffic engineer that's looking at this slide. The ITE yellow light practice is not an engineering practice. My last two webinars went over this. I described the physics, and then I described the misapplications of physics. I tell you how you can go get these last two webinars here. It's not an engineering practice because it is misapplications of physics, and the practice does harm the public, as I showed you in the last uh, couple of webinars. The, 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 the practice is not in agreement with nature. And this is a jurisprudence principle. King Canute would not like the ITE practice. A little review uh, of the ITE practice is this formula here. If you want to fix all the red light camera problems, get rid of the red light camera industry and reduce all the crashes by 90%, all you do is remove this two here. Without the two, it actually abides by the laws of physics. With the two, it doesn't. There are other problems here. This recalculated red interval literally puts conflicting traffic in the intersection at the same time, literally programmed to harm people. They do it because it's operationally more efficient for the intersection if they put some cars in the intersection at the same time. They assume that conflicting traffic that gets the right of ways is gonna notice these late entering vehicles. Here's the four physics problems with the yellow light. I'm not gonna go over them again, but there they are. You can go back to uh, webinar two and read all about it. Um, in my opinion, this is what I put on my, uh, my, uh, my affidavits. It is my opinion that the ITE yellow change interval practice each year inevitably causes hundreds of thousands of drivers to run red lights, receive citations, and a crash, despite drivers taking all reasonable steps to conform to the law and to keep themselves and others safe. Now, as my lawyers like, like me to put, it is my opinion that at the physicist in me wants just to leave out these words and say, the yellow change interval practice each year inevitably causes stated as a fact. And because of the last two webinars and the physics says exactly that and all the statistics back up the physics, literally the ITE formula causes 90% of those who run red lights to run red lights because of the bad physics. Now about, about the uh, ITE formula, most DOTs, if not all, use the ITE yellow change interval practice and have put that into their DOT specs or even Virginia state law. But note, the ITE practice is not a federal standard. The ITE practice is not a federal guideline. ITE puts a disclaimer on its practice. If you open up any of the ITE publications, like the traffic engineering handbooks on the very first pages, we disclaim everything. We don't guarantee anything. And guess what? Not once do they ever call the yellow change interval an engineering practice. It's just a practice without the adjective. ITE does not recommend its own practice. The ITE uh, yellow change interval formula is they don't even recommend it. It's not an official recommended practice even within ITE. ITE is trying to make it one, and I'm on, and I'm on that uh, I'm on that panel discussion regarding the new intended and recommended practice regarding this now, and I can tell you right now that IT right now denies that its practice has any authority, that, and that they were not they're not the IT does not want to take any action to fix this formula none. They've been using it for 50 years. They believe that because we've always been using it this way, it's right from now on. We're not, we're not gonna go back to square one and get the physics right. How can they get away with this? IT is not licensed to practice engineering in any state. IT offers engineering services, but not does not certify its work. So 
without licensure and without signing and sealing work, there's no responsibility, there's no accountability. Traffic engineers just pick up the ITE practice because it's there. Uh, they don't know any better. It's That's just how it is. There's nothing else. So physics, uh, a form, these formulas uh, these are, are physics. A licensee shall perform services only in areas of the licensee's competence. Well, the formula is not traffic engineering specific, it's physics. The licensee should be competent in physics before actually doing anything with the yellow chain general formula. So when a, when a licensee, when a licensed professional engineer uses the ITE formula, he's actually using something outside his, his level of competence. He uses it, but he doesn't know what it means, which is bad. Uh, to show you that the, the expert, the traffic engineers do not know what physics even is, here's, here's as a deposition from a, one of the town of Cary's expert traffic engineers. I didn't mention her name. But we we asked her about uh, like uh, it's all about Newton's second law of motion, F equals m a. Uh, Paul Stam asks her, uh, do you have you know about F equals m a? And she and she said, I've heard of that equation, and that's pure physics. Yes. And is that something you would apply to traffic engineering because you're talking about force, mass, and acceleration? And she says, as a very limited vacuum world, yes. I keep on chuckling every time. I, you know, physics doesn't, physics applies to everything. Not a, it's not limited, especially not to a world that's been cleaned or not cleaned. I, I just chuckle every time I, I read that. And then he asks her, do you recall in North Carolina, ITE got together as a separate organization and gave the NCDOT, solicited the NCDOT to write the NCDOT the yellow light spec. Do you call the meetings of the task force, the NCITE task force, or any subcommittee that you were on, any discussion about whether the physics of the formula actually fit the engineering? Hardcore physics, she says, like what you're talking about? Yes. Answer, no. There was no discussion about that, I'm aware of. No one even even touches the physics of this formula. Uh, one of my expert witnesses was Dr. Elizabeth George. She's the, the chairman of the physics department at Wittenberg University in Ohio. And uh, the town of Cary is asking her uh, what the definition of physics is. And she goes, well, the question is, and why would engineering students be required to take a course in physics? Well, actually, Paul Stam asked the question. Elizabeth says, because engineers, since engineers is based on the way nature works and the laws and the models for how nature works, the engineers need to understand those at a basic level in order to apply them in the real world. Physics, real world. The kind of carries lawyer says, move to strike. She's moving to strike the laws of physics. It is, you, I mean, there's a video deposition of this and you should see Dr. Elizabeth George's face when. Miss Martineau said, objection, move to strike. It's like, what universe are you from? Is engineering the application of physics and other sciences? Yes. All right, kind of says, says it all there. Now, we're almost getting ready to close. And uh, at the PENC website, I, I listed a bunch of questions about who the guilty are. And I will just read the questions as I wrote them on the PENC website, and I'll answer them. So given the class action lawsuit against the town of Cary, North Carolina, Cary motion to strike the laws of physics. Can the town of Cary do that? No, but it certainly tried. Uh, are the laws of physics binding in the court of law? Yes, through the Engineering Practice Act. These questions are answer, and answers are took years to, to, to figure out. It's, you're just reading the, the end result. Uh, who is responsible for the bad physics of the yellow light? 
the licensed professional engineer who signed and sealed the traffic signal timing chart. It's the engineer who is ultimately responsible for getting the math wrong. In Illinois, it's actually a crime written into the own statutes that it's crime for the engineer to get the math wrong. And if he leaves out any caveats, like the formula only works for these cases, if the engineer leaves those out, it's a crime. You have three crimes and you go to jail. There are misdemeanors, you go to jail after the third one. Who is liable for the bad physics of the yellow light? The license, for, liability and responsibility are two different things. The court is not really interested in the truth as much as, as it's interested in those who are culpable. Now, I lost the town of Kerry case, but I didn't lose because I was wrong. I lose because we went after the wrong people. We should have went after the engineers. The town of Kerry was simply doing what the engineers have allowed it to do. So who is liable for the bad physics? The licensed professional engineer, in the very least, he risks his license. The engineer may not be financially liable, his employer may be. Is local government financially liable? Yes. In North Carolina, all local governments are charged with enforcing the Engineering Practice Act. A city, I mean, like we just found this one out like three weeks ago, but that's true. After all these years, this, the town of Cary can't just be let off the hook because it's actually required to enforce its own Engineering Practice Act, the state's Engineering Practice Act. Also, a city adopting a red light camera ordinance assumes financial responsibility of the red light camera programming engineering at all. That's how it works in North Carolina. Is the DOT financially liable? Yes, indirectly. Can the DOT wash its hands from responsibility by invoking sovereign immunity? This was really interesting, the, the backstory behind this one. Uh, a client of mine in Wilmington, I just simply told him to file a small claim of 50 bucks against the traffic engineer who, who uh, timed his yellow light. Well, that brought out the, the attorney general of North Carolina who's gonna defend the traffic engineer. And, and the first defense, we have sovereign immunity. We do no wrong. Sovereign immunity is the Latin for it means uh, the king can do no wrong. So you can't just say the DOT because it's the king. You're not allowed to say the king can do no wrong. But what the attorney general doesn't tell the client is that there's caveats to that. And the NCO DOT gives up its sovereign immunity if it partners with a private firm. And the DMV, part of the DOT certainly does by partnering with the red light, it has to partner with the red light camera company because it gives the red light camera companies access to the DMV vehicle license database. So the NCUD, without the NCDOT's partnership cooperation, there is no red light camera industry, no program. Eight, is the Institute of Transportation Engineers liable? In North Carolina, yes. North Carolina holds private organizations liable and ITE offered its uncertified work to the DOT as a separate organization not licensed to practice engineering. And this is my uh, last slide. And to the two attorneys that are looking in on this, trying to get a grasp on the scope of the red light camera industry, it looks like a four-headed hydra. It looks like this. And uh, uh, I'll just read the, in, this is Greek mythology, the Hydra stays back. And one of the second labor of Hercules was to kill the Hydra. The problem with the Hydra that makes it so resilient is that if you cut off the head, another one grows back in its place. But if you can cut off the one, one head called the immortal head, if you cut off that one, then the whole Hydra dies. And that the immortal head doesn't grow back, it's just immortal. And the other heads defend defend the, the immortal head. So this applies, I'm applying it to the red light camera industry. So the second of the 12 labors of Hercules was to kill the Hydra. The Hydra had four heads. Well, I'm, uh, I'm taking creative license here now. The Hydra had four heads. Two of the heads spit red light camera tickets. One head sang the praises of the red light camera tickets. One head, the yellow one that does not grow back, did not know physics. Without the yellow head, the other heads would not spit and sing. 
so the other heads defended and concealed the yellow head. Now, ITE is creating all is creating the problem, the physics problems, which make drivers run red lights. The red light camera firms have the technology to issue tickets to all those who ITE is forcing to run red lights. The red light camera firms use the power of government to enforce a law that opposes the laws of nature. And the government uses all its power to collect the money and to save face. And so if you, if this man here, this driver here is able to chop the head off the government, like for instance, if you get, if you're able to spend years to get rid of the program out of Cary, North Carolina, it just grows back somewhere else. Like in Fayetteville, North Carolina, you chop it off, it grows back somewhere else. Red light camera firms, you know, these things are just simply growing and multiplying. Uh, IIHS is the Insurance Institute of Highway Safety. IIHS is a part of the red light camera industry. It makes millions and tens of millions of dollars of profit off of red light camera tickets by insurance, by raising driver's insurance rates. IIHS is the lobbying body of automobile insurance companies. You get a red light camera ticket, you're, you're in California and Oregon and Arizona, your, your premium, your individual premium goes up. If you're in New Orleans, for instance, there is a civil penalty in New Orleans. The individual rates don't go up, but IIHS takes the red light camera effectiveness studies, safety reports, and raises the whole area rates by tens of millions of dollars. And there's all sorts of proof for this, that that's what they're up to. Part of IIHS, one of its consortium members is AAA. And so if you have read the, the news lately, AAA, that you know, the, the moment, you know, the very week that we, you know, the North Carolina Board of Engineers uh, publishes that you know, ATS is practicing engineering without a license, that Colorado says Redflex is practicing engineering without a license. The moment all this negative publicity comes out against the red light camera companies, IIHF starts singing the praises of the red light camera firms in government. Uh, if IIHS is simply just when Hugh, if you guys want to read some of the most ridiculous reports about red light camera effectiveness studies, read the reports of Wen Hu, who writes these reports, and her predecessor, who wrote reports for IIHS, was Richard Redding. And Richard Redding is uh, uh, the father of the red light camera industry. ITE, IIHS, the red light camera firms, they're all in bed together. There's people that cross over. I know which people these are, but I'm not going to mention them here. And that concludes the presentation. Thank you so much. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Um, the first, are there any cases where arguments against cameras along these lines have prevailed in a court? The first time the first time this is we've got to this point is right now. The, the, the case in Greenville, North Carolina is testing this very thing right now. It's taken us years to present the arguments and to get the laws down, and, but it's happening right now in Greenville. One case just started on these lines in Suffolk County. So it's, that's it, next, next question. All right. Doesn't the use of Zatuni seal in this manner constitute a violation of the PE code of ethics? Yes, it certainly does. He does this. He, well, you know, this, this is, well, uh, it does. I think, I think, I don't know. I don't think Zatuni even knows that ATS is using his seal everywhere. They're just taking his seal a, a jpeg of it and and copying it to their templates for all these states i i don't even think zaytuni is even aware of it zaytuni lives in florida and so because he lives in florida the red light camera installation plans in florida are most likely legitimate because in order to open a engineering firm in florida 
you have to have a branch office there and a branch office has to have a resident engineer that's there. So Zaytuni lives in Orlando. So I think I haven't seen a Florida red light camera plan, but my guess is that those are actually legitimate. Uh, everywhere else, I, ha I haven't even seen Zaytuni's. I've seen Zaytuni's seal everywhere, but I haven't seen his signature. Okay. All right. We oh, one one more just came in. We'll do this quickly. Okay. In Manitoba, the regulator act actively works to suppress and ignore complaints. The first step in this is demanding the name of the engineer. Companies and government actively resist efforts to determine the name of engineers responsible. Do other places use such perfectly crooked interpretations of the law? Oh yes, it's a big one. Um, uh, yeah, the, the, even the Board of Engineers here in North Carolina is aware, and the, the cities and the red light camera companies have done it to the Board of Engineers here. The Board of Engine, these red light camera firms have have no respect for for any law whatsoever, and they will blot out and read. They'll give you the they'll give you the red light camera installation plans or the traffic engineering plans, and if they're sealed. They'll blot out the name so that you can't read it. Blotting it out is illegal in North Carolina. You can't blot it out. There's only one case where you can blot it out. And uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina, I asked Fayetteville, North Carolina for its traffic signal plans. They gave me, the, uh, they gave me five plans and each one was blotted out. The seal was blotted out, big black square. And I wrote and saying, we don't have to, they said, we don't have to give you the name of the engineers on these plans. And then I wrote them back and said, the only way you can not give me the name is that these plans are currently in bid, that, that there's currently bid proposals on what's in these plans. But you guys have already installed these traffic inter intersections, these signals, give them give them to me and they turned around and, and gave me the unredacted plans but that did not stop uh, american traffic solutions from holding back all the plans from the board of engineers but one but yes uh, suffolk county is crazy uh there are they won't there's no seal no nothing on any of their traffic signal plans or their red light camera installation plans you don't know who's responsible and that's that's part of the that's part of the uh that's part of the fraud which governments try to perpetuate because you can't get to the source of the problem it, it puts lawyers and attorneys plaintiffs trying to prosecute these things litigate on hold for like years trying to get down to who's responsible so if, for the person in Canada, yes, it happens. Like I think so far at the moment, nine times out of 10, they will not, cities will not cooperate. All right, we were gonna wrap that up uh, right now. Um, if you do have additional questions that we didn't get to, you can email them to exec, E-X-E-C at P-E-N-C dot org and I will get them to Brian. Um, your PDH form and NCBEL survey will be emailed out this afternoon. We do have some upcoming PENC events that I want to make you aware of. We have our Charlotte seminar on Tuesday, October 29th. And then we have our large Raleigh seminars, December 9th through 11th, where you can get 18 PDHs. Um, information about both of those is on our website, penc.org. Our next webinar is Wednesday, October 23rd on staged bridge construction. Thank you all so much for attending today, and we will see you next time. Okay, Katie.